So we have this linear uh, relationship between vapor and pressure that it's exponential. The vapor pressure is a constant times E raised to this uh, awesome exponent. But we can, we can rearrange this and make it linear by taking the natural log of both sides. And so that gives us the natural log of the vapor pressure is equal to minus delta H over R times 1 over T. I separated the 1 over T out, but this right here is that exponent plus the natural log of beta. So now we can graph natural log versus 1 over T, and that'll give us um, a straight line. So this, this is X, I'm sorry, this is Y, Y equals, here's the slope, that's M, this is, this term is X, and then this is the intercept, intercept. okay, so Y equals MX plus B is a line. So if we graph the natural log of the vapor pressure versus 1 over the temperature, then we can have a slope that's delta H minus delta H over R. R is the gas constant. And this is a, a constant, which we usually don't care about that much. Any questions? I'm not going to ask you to derive that. I just want to talk it through so you know we're not just making stuff up here. <coughs> Pardon me? I'll give you this equation, the clausius clapeyron equation. I just need you to be able to use it. So here's an example, a clausius clapeyron plot. So you measure the vapor pressure, and um, here it was measured in millimeters of mercury. And so we have the natural log of P, and over here we have 1 over T. And um, so now instead of a curve, we get a straight line. It's not perfect because it's actual data, but it's linear. And so you can graph the line, use a program like Excel to find the, the best line and give you the equation. And so the equation gives us a slope of minus 3478 Kelvin. Well, that's equal to negative heat of vaporization over R. And so from that information, we can calculate what the heat of vaporization is for this substance. Any questions? Units are important. You notice that the temperature here is in Kelvin. That's important because a Kelvin temperature, you're never going to have zero, right? You're never going to end up with one over zero because that's undefined. So you've got to use Kelvin for this. So let's do an example. So the vapor pressure of carbon tetrachloride is measured as a function of the temperature and the results are tabulated. Determine the heat of vaporization of carbon tetrachloride. So here we have uh, temperature and here we have pressure in TOR. This one's a real hard one to do on the iPad. We have to graph this data and, and find the linear regression line for it. Okay, so I'm going to pause this while we do that. So I opened up Excel, and here I've got the temperature in Kelvin, the pressure in Tor, and then I did 1 over T and the natural log of P, and I graphed that. I didn't put titles on here, but this is the natural log of P versus 1 over T. It's pretty linear, and here's our data, um, I mean our, our equation. And so the slope here is what's important. You know, the question is, how can I write that down and not lose it? Okay, so we graph the data, and we find that the slope, ah, uh, it's the Monday after spring break, that's rough. The slope equals minus 3773.5. So the clausius clapeyron equation tells us that that is equal to negative 
delta H of vaporization over R. So what's R? Well, if we look back here, um, in this problem they used R is uh, 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. So R equals 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. Um, I think in that previous example, there may be an issue with the units. Um, a joule is is related to sorry is related to liter atmospheres. That's the relationship. And so what I'm thinking here is that if this is in tor, or in the previous one was in millimeters of mercury, I'm not sure that those units are going to work out correctly. Because here our slope is coming from um, this Kelvin and Tor, and it's the natural log of that. So I think that's going to get kind of screwed up. I think what we should have here is the vapor pressure in atmospheres. So let's fix that. So I went back into my Excel spreadsheet here, and I put the pressure in in atmospheres and did the natural log of that and graphed that instead. And then when we look at the equation, we find out that the slope is exactly the same. So this is showing us that the units actually on the pressure don't matter. Okay? So that's kind of cool. The slope is going to be the same. The intercept will be different. But we're not caring about the intercept right now. We just want the slope. Okay. So let's go back to where we were, if that's possible. And no, it's not possible, but that's okay, because I wrote the number on the chalkboard. So the slope is negative delta H of vaporization divided by R, and that is equal to minus 3, 3, I'm sorry, 3773.5. And R is equal to 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. So to find the heat of vaporization, we're going to rearrange this equation. I'm going to multiply both sides by R, and, and change the sign. So heat of vaporization is going to equal R times that slope. And the slope, um, if we're going to put units on that, it would be, it's the rise over the run that would be uh, Kelvin's. So we had a negative on this side and a negative on the other side. So if I multiply both sides by negative 1, the negatives go away. And I get the heat of vaporization is this ideal gas constant times the slope. So it's 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin times 3773.5 Kelvin. Um, 31373 uh, joules per mole. We'd probably put that in kilojoules and here, we're just going to kind of take an approximation at the, uh, at the sig figs. So we'll maybe say, well, that's uh, 314 kilojoules, no, 31.4, sorry, kilojoules per mole.
Any questions? Sig figs kind of get, you, you can't really follow rules of significant figures when you're doing a linear regression and using the slope or the intercept from that line in your equation. And so then you just kind of have to be reasonable. Any questions? I'm not going to make you graph data and do a linear regression line on an exam. Okay? But if I gave you the graph with the equation, then you should be able to do this and calculate the heat of vaporization from the slope. Okay? We can also express the clausius clapeyron equation in a two-point form. So you don't actually have to graph anything. And this is useful for predicting the vapor pressure if you know what the heat of vaporization is. So you can look up the heat of vaporization, say, at room temperature or at zero or at 100 degrees. But what if you need to know what it is at 250 degrees Celsius? You can, you can predict the heat of vaporization based on, on this. I'm sorry, not the heat of vaporization, the, um, the pressure, yes. The vapor pressure, Ooh. okay. So this is the um, two-point form, and I'm not going to make you memorize this equation either, but you need to know how to use it. So the natural log of the ratio of pressure one to pressure two is equal to the slope, that del minus delta H of vaporization over R, times the difference one over T2 minus one over T1. So if, we're, if we know T1 and T2 and delta H and one of the pressures, then we can find the other pressure. So it would be a problem like this. Um, propane has a normal boiling point of minus 42 degrees Celsius and a heat of vaporization of 19.04 kilojoules per mole. What's the vapor pressure of propane at 25 degrees Celsius? Well, we need that two-point form of the equation. So the natural log of P2 over P1 is equal to negative delta H vaporization over R, 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1. Temperatures have to be in Kelvin. We don't want any negative temperatures in here, and we can't deal with anything that's zero. So we do have two temperatures here, right? For minus 42 and 25, but they're both in Fahrenheit. And so we need to convert them to Kelvin. So 25 is going to end up being 298.15 Kelvin. And 42, we'll take 273.15, um, subtract 42. And that's going to give us 231. 0.15 Kelvin. Here's our delta H. We know what R is, although R is looking a bit like a K. That's, that's confusing. Let's fix that. There, R. You can make this easier or harder on yourself by choosing which is 1 and which is 2. I'm going to be solving for one of these pressures. It's easiest to solve for pressure 2 instead of solving for pressure 1. So I want to find pressure 2. Um, so that means what's the vapor pressure at 25? That means I'm going to use this as T2. So this is T2, and this is T1. What seems to be missing from this? Well, we know R is, is 8.314. What's P1? We're solving for P2, but what's P1? It's kind of hiding. The, the normal boiling point of a substance is the temperature at which its vapor pressure equals the atmospheric pressure. So they're not telling us what the atmospheric pressure is, but we can assume that it's one atmosphere. If they're not specifying, then you assume one atmosphere. And they're not asking us for units 
on the pressure, specific units, right? They're not saying in atmospheres or in tor. So we, I think it would be easier to just um, do it in atmospheres. So pressure one is equal to one atmosphere. And that would be, you could assume that's an exact number because those temperatures are going to limit things. So if we plug all these numbers in here then, we've got the natural log of P2 divided by one atmosphere. And that's going to equal negative the heat of vaporization, 19.04 uh, kilojoules per mole, divided by 8.314 joules what happened to that, J? Joules per mole Kelvin. You see a problem with the units? We've got kilojoules on top and joules on the bottom. 1 over T2, 298.15 Kelvin. And T1 is 231.15 Kelvin. So when we look at the units, the moles are going to cancel out. Um, this is 1 over 1 over Kelvin, and this is 1 over Kelvin, and so the Kelvins are going to cancel out. But we've got kilojoules on top and joules on the bottom. We need to fix that. Um, otherwise, our answer is going to be off. Well, what if instead of the kilo here, I wrote what kilo means? Kilo means 10 to the third, right? So. 19.04 times 10 to the third joules. Natural log of P2 divided by 1 is the same as the natural log of P2, right? So over here I've got natural log of P2 is equal to, and then I just need to carefully commune with my calculator. So I'm going to have negative 19.04 times 10 to the third divided by 8.314 times the quantity 1 divided by 298.15 minus 1 divided by 231.15 close parentheses enter so this gives me 2 2.2 2263990086 and the units on that are going to be um, nothing, right? The joules and the moles and the Kelvin all cancel out. So how do we get P2 out of this? We have to undo the natural log. Undoing a base 10 log, LOG, is just 10 raised to the power. Um, so we're going to do E raised to this power will give us P2. And E raised to this messy thing over here is what that will equal. And so we're getting 9.266. And the unit on that would be atmospheres. <coughs> and you just kind of guess at the sig figs on this one. Um, that's probably a little bit much. Probably, probably more accurate to say like, you know, 9.3 <coughs> or something. Any questions? The math gets a little hairy here for some people. If you need, tro if you need help with your calculator or figuring out how to do this, please ask me. Now, this pressure that we came up with, a pressure of nine atmospheres, that's nine times as great as normal atmospheric pressure. That's actually really high. So you look at that and you're like, is that OK? Is that right? Well, this is propane. Propane boils at minus 42. And here we have it at 25. 
that's way above its boiling point, right? So then we do expect that the vapor pressure of it is going to be much higher than one atmosphere. Okay, any questions? I'll give you this equation for the exam, but you should be able to solve a problem like this. And this is one of the hard things is normal boiling point, that means the pressure there is one atmosphere because that's what normal boiling point means. Okay, the critical point. So if, if we have a liquid in a sealed container, it's going to develop a vapor pressure. If we heat it in a sealed container, what's going to happen to that vapor pressure? It's going to go up, right? So we heat it up. As the temperature rises, the pressure does as well. So you get more and more gas molecules, and that causes the gas to become more dense because you've got more and more gas particles in this same space. What happens is at a particular point called the critical point, the gas and the liquid states merge, and they become what's called a supercritical fluid. It is not a gas. It is not a liquid. It's both at the same time. So you have to do this in a, in a chamber that can withstand a lot of pressure. And so it's kind of hard to get good pictures of it, but here's some pictures. So here we see through this little window, there's a liquid and a gas. And as you warm it up, as you heat it up, the vapor pressure increases, the gas becomes more and more dense. And when you get to the critical point, the critical temperature or above, we have one state. It's not a gas. It's not a liquid either. It's crazy, huh? Can you do it at home? No. That would be fun, but no. The, yeah, the problem is you're not going to have a container that's going to be able to withstand the pressure. You know, this is sort of, you know, like the labels on aerosol cans say, don't, don't put it in the fire, right? Because you heat it up the pressure gets too great for the, the rating on the canister and it'll actually explode and that's really dangerous. Have pressure relief valves anyways. Yeah, some of them have pressure relief valves, um, but they're, they're just not going to hold that sort of pressure and so you need a very specialized container to do this in. So the critical temperature is um, abbreviated TC. That's the temperature at which a supercritical fluid forms. At any temperature above that, you're going to have the supercritical fluid. You can't have the liquid above that. And the pressure there um, at that transition would be called the supercritical pressure. Supercritical fluids are actually very useful as solvents. Okay, um, If you want to decaffeinate coffee, right, which is a, a big deal because people want to drink coffee, but they don't want all the caffeine. I don't, personally don't understand that because I want the caffeine without the coffee but um, they can use um, supercritical CO2 to decaffeinate the coffee. The thing is, you want, you want the caffeine to come out, but not all the stuff that gives the flavors from the coffee. And so you can extract the caffeine into supercritical CO2 and then, you know, flush that off and leave the coffee behind. And what's especially beautiful about this is there are no residues because you take it out of the chamber and any CO2 that's left just evaporates and goes away. It's harmless. It's a you know, significant part of our air anyway. So there's a use for supercritical fluids. Any questions?